Hi, I'm Sarah Marks. I'm here with Virtual AWP. And today I am going to be in conversation with uh, author Sue William Silverman. Sue William Silverman is a memoirist, poet, and teacher of writing at the Vermont College of Fine Arts. She has published several books, including Because I Remember Terror, Father, I Remember You, Love Sick, One Woman's Journey Through Sexual Addiction, The Pat Boone Fan Club, My Life as a White Anglo-Saxon Jew, and Fearless Confessions, A Writer's Guide to Memoir. Today, Sue and I are going to be discussing her most recent book of, of a memoir in essays, How to Survive Death and Other Inconveniences. Hi, Sue. Hi, Sarah. Nice to see you here. And thank you. And thanks to AWP for having me here. So I think we're going to start. I'm going to read a section from um, my new book, um, How to Survive Death and Other Inconveniences. And the section that I'm going to read is called Miss Route 17's Blue Period. And I just should say that uh, Miss Route 17 is kind of an alter ego that I dubbed myself back when I was a teenager. And I was sort of cruising up and down this uh, industrial blighted highway. And the only other thing that I'll mention is that there are a few uh, scientific references to octopuses in this section. Miss Route 17's Blue Period. I discover a dead octopus one Galveston morning after spending the night on the beach. Tentacles swirl in tides as if it is still alive. I pick up a stick of driftwood and poke it. Even dead, it is scary, prehistoric. I prod it farther up the sand away from waves and sit beside it, curious now that it can't embrace me with suction cups, can't blind me with a stream of ink. This morning, however, I am blinded by a sheen of aluminum sun reflecting off the gulf. I arrived here yesterday in a silent splash of moonlight with a man who isn't my husband. The man disappeared somewhere between Venus and Jupiter into an expanse of inky sky. To survive in the deep ocean, octopuses evolved a copper rather than iron-based blood called hemocyanin, which turns its blood blue. This copper base is more efficient at transporting oxygen than hemoglobin when water temperature is very low and not much oxygen is around. Back in first grade, when I lived in DC, I knew a boy born blue. He suffered from a congenital heart disease, a condition called cyanosis. His blood wasn't receiving enough oxygen, hence his blue you. Afternoons, the blue boy sat on the front stoop of his home, usually silent. He never played hopscotch or marbles or jump rope. His lips and nail, nail beds were darker blue than his face or arms. I once asked if I could touch his lips. He nodded. I pressed a finger to them, then looked to see if the blue transferred. It hadn't. I wanted to be blue, too. His skin was magical, unlike my own. I colored my nails blue with the crayon. It didn't last. Neighbors whispered that the blue boy would die young. And indeed, one day he was there. One day he wasn't. Nevertheless, the indelibility of the blue boy himself remains with me. His magical blue remains on me. My husband may or may not notice my absence this Galveston morning. Maybe he can't see me here by the gulf, as if camouflaged by ink. Maybe, while I slept, the octopus injected me with poison, paralyzing me, confusing my sense of smell, taste, and sight, my sense of right and wrong. I lie back on the sand, my long, tangled hair heavy with mist.
My damp skirt clings to my thighs. My sheer white blouse offers scant protection. The jagged caw of seagulls unravels from a pale blue horizon. A tincture of night presses my tongue. A taste that lingers. Penny with a tail was my other mystical childhood friend in D.C. Not that I knew for sure she had a tail. It was only a rumor circulating around the neighborhood. So I never saw it, though I endlessly imagined it. I wanted to believe in it. Maybe these two magical children existed because we all lived across the street from a cemetery. Dead people living so close to me, not that you could say they actually lived, scared me. I knew the necessity of amulets in order not to get dragged beneath the earth where they, in whatever form, dwelled. When I walked across the cemetery, walked right on top of them, I felt lucky none thrust a desiccated hand out of the ground to grab my ankle. Penny with a tail and blue boy were, in effect, emissaries sent to protect me from death and otherworldly hazards. I, aglow in their aura, was safe. Surely myths override reality, are more enduring. Under the spell of my friends, even after Blue Boy died, I was likewise anointed with a blue shawl of unending destiny. I miss the rawness of an unsettled me, one I prefer to the now me, who knows better than to spend the night on a beach with a stranger. A me who has forgotten how to take risks. I long for that morning on the Galveston beach because the ache deposits me back to a time of possibilities. I realize the options were negative ones, but maybe I can long for that younger version of me without needing to be her. How can I long for a past full of regret? To live, you have to be wounded. Years after that day in Galveston, I am channel surfing and see the man, that stranger, starring in a movie. Later, I see him in another movie. He is tall and blonde, perfect. How did we find each other on a beach in Galveston? He would not remember me, I am quite sure. I am the only one who remembers. And because I do, in that moment, I see a life of what might have been. An octopus's arms contain neurons separate from its brain with its own set of memories, knowing how, say, to open a shellfish while its eyes glance for danger, death, sex, blue octopus love. I want to touch the octopus, even though it scares me. I turn on my side until my eye is a few inches from a tentacle. I briefly swipe a finger across its skin. Sticky, squishy, it smells of ancient underwater caves. I imagine diving deep into fathomless water that tinges my skin transparent blue, yet also opaque enough to hide me, sprouting blue limbs to propel me away. Dusk is electric blue, or rose blue, or limestone blue, or pearl blue, or inky blue, or the moment in late afternoon when love, death, loss, and longing all together halo the day moon. Everything feels close to me, clinging like sand on moist skin. I could live in an underwater cave where dusk casts blue shadows across muddy sand. I could live alone with only blue memories grasping me like tentacles of an octopus. That night, 
still in the white skirt and blouse. I sit in a Galveston bar, troubled with tanned men cradling bottles of Shiner or shots of cheap anything. Sea smoke obscures lights mirroring the bar, bluing them. I am the girl perched on the last stool at a quarter past midnight, dreaming my way toward morning, deep with blue regret that I wear forever. I do not think any of these thoughts in the moment, only later. Now am I nostalgic for that encounter on the beach with the man and the dead octopus for all past moments, even if painful. I remember each period of time as a brilliant wash of color, regardless of loss, abandonment, death, blue and timeless as metaphor. Memory isn't a transcription of what happened. Memory is emotional history, a language of the senses. Memory colors outside the lines, turning, in this case, everything blue. Before I run out of oxygen, before my skin turns blue, I need to tell these stories about a blue boy, about a girl with a tail, about an octopus, stories to decipher how to understand love, which is a way to understand death, loss of love being itself a kind of death. So even though I have been misloved and have even been unloving, even though the ache has been smoky, deep, and blue, I wish I had three hearts like an octopus, three times the longing, three times the regret, but also three times the love, three times the life. Thank you. So I really love that essay, and I particularly love a lot of the imagery in it, um, that the image of, of um, you living across from the cemetery really strikes me. Um, Thank you. Each time I read it, and even more so hearing you read it. Um, and I think to sort of move into our conversation, so much of this essay is about memory and so much of this book um, is about memory and the different forms it takes. And I think something that I'm really interested in is the way um, these, the, the layers of memory uh, shape these essays, how you have the recollection of a memory in order to write it. Um, and then you have the relic of the essay itself that has uh, reproduced the memory. Um, so I just wonder if you have anything to say about that. Yes. Um, I mean, a large part of this book is about uh, memory just in and of itself in that, um, okay, so the book is um, How to Survive Death and Other Inconveniences. And so clearly I my goal is to survive death. But assuming that I can't quite pull that off, then sort of the idea is that um, we live our, we still have our memories uh, that live on that by writing memories and collecting them in, in our writing. And that, so even if I don't actually end up being able to live forever, that memories themselves can be immortalized and be eternal. So that's part of what the book is about. But then, um, but but more than that, um, I think what's really interesting is sort of the fluidity of memory. So that, um, you know, when something first happened, let's say I remember when my grandfather died when I was in about third grade. And so I have that memory. Uh, but then over the years, let's say then when I'm a teenager and I think back on it, the memory shifts. Or then when it comes to actually write it, the memory shifts again. So there's always this sort of fluidity of memory. And it's not, memory is not static. It's always, um, you know, kind of moving. And I think of it too, kind of in terms of like a palm obsessed in that they sort of layer each other. And so the memories kind of flow through time. And which I think is just a kind of a fascinating idea about um, memories, how we're always, 
interpreting them, and then reinterpreting them, and then again reinterpreting them, kind of depends of, depending upon sort of what has happened uh, to us in our lives between the original event and whatever it is we're thinking about it. You know, as our as things in our lives uh, happen, then in many ways we'll see the memory or reflect upon the memory in many different ways over time. I think you say it really well in the essay there when you say memory is emotional history. Um, I think that's a really interesting way to put that in that uh, the way that you perceive it shapes so much of, of how it changes over time. Yeah, I mean, this idea of emotional history, I think, is something to think about when writing creative nonfiction, too, because creative nonfiction is not sort of like historical facts. It is more emotional uh, truth and emotion and sort of the way we interpret our memories. I mean, that is its own form of of truth. So it, we don't have to like, well, did this actually happen exactly this way? That's not what we're after. We're after right. what the emotion of, of any given moment. I love that idea. Um, and as we're talking about recalling memories, something that's really interesting to me in the book is that you seem to reach through such expanses of time to recall different points. Um, and a lot of it is such vivid imagery of memories. Um, and so I'm kind of wondering how you do that as, as a writer. Um, so is there, has there been like a journaling process your whole life that says, you know, some of this I, I have, I, I know what song was playing in this bowling alley 30 years ago, or is that also part of that emotional history and that more of a feeling than a, a you know, factual history? Right. Um, I'm always, I, so I teach at Vermont College of Fine Arts, and I'm always embarrassed kind of to tell this to my students that I've never kept a journal. I mean, not <laughs> once, ever. I mean, I just, I would never know what to say in it. Um, so none, none of this comes from a journal. But when I sit down to write, what, um, what I do is I try to enter a very sensory place. And I try to just sort of like sink myself into this moment of um, what did any given moment kind of sound like or smell like or even sort of metaphorically taste like. I mean, I just submerge myself in sensory, in the senses. And by doing that, it's amazing how that can evoke memory. I mean, like if I just sort of sat here and think, God, you know, what happened back on this say birthday party in fourth grade or whatever you know like I would never be able to just like come up with it but when I'm in the writing process I mean writing itself jogs my memory I mean I hardly know what I think unless I'm writing so I'm in the writing process I'm writing I'm trying to recreate a moment and then I'm I as I say I totally submerge myself in this uh, sensory um, kind of soup in a way where all the senses are sort of mixed up together. And really it's from that, that um, memory arises. So, um, you know, for writers out there, just really focus on your senses, because I think that that, I think all of our memories are kind of um, glommed into our different senses. I really like the idea there that the act of writing almost forms the memory that it's not really there and that it gets shaped by that act of creating something and putting it on a page. Very much so. I mean, particularly things like that happened, oh, maybe when I was much younger than say in elementary school. Like I remember when I was working on my first uh, book, which has a you know fairly large section from elementary school and I'd be writing and then all of a sudden I would remember like, oh my God, you know, this, um, happened. I, um, I remember my father had this electric saw and uh, just sort of, and it was in the living room and just the sound of the saw and then remembering the scent of sawdust. It just made me remember a lot of things that happened. You know, this was back when I was like in uh, maybe first and second grade. So um, it just, you know, so there I am writing it 
And as I get one sense down on the page and that sort of, you know, jump starts another one. And it's, it's kind of like following this trail of the senses in a way through your life. I love that. Um, and another thing that's really interesting there to me is what stays with us and, and what kind of goes away when we're talking about memory. There's a scene in the book where you are describing your first wedding and sort of how that day is, is blank. Um, and there's not a whole lot there that you've recalled on the page and you have more, more detail and more vivid imagery from another wedding that you are a guest at. Um, and that's really, really interesting to me, the thought that we can pull the sense of, of the smell of sawdust from when you were eight years old on, on a day that may seem inconsequential, but then something as, as significant as a wedding day goes away. <laughs> I know, that says a lot about both the man I married and the wedding day. <laughs> Hopefully he's not listening to this. Sorry, I don't remember you. But, um, I, you know, I think about that because when I was writing that and I was you know, sort of trying to, quote, recreate this wedding, there was like this blank spot. And I just can't, like, I don't remember saying I do. I mean, I assume I do. I did say I do because we ended up married. And I think it comes down to what is sort of relevant in your overall narrative of life and what isn't, because obviously we can't remember everything that happened. And I think that what stays with us does come down to, um, you know, what is the narrative that's an ongoing one for any given book? You know, like I've written these different books and each sort of has its own kind of thematic focus. And um, so in this book about, you know, surviving death and my fear of death, and the reason why I'm even writing about getting married at all is because basically, yeah, I got married, but I also got divorced twice. And so the book is also, it's not just about the fear of physical death. It's also about... Um, Oh, spiritual and emotional deaths, and in some ways also sort of how to survive life. I know I'm getting a little bit off the topic here, but I'm getting back to it. And but so this marriage really it's so almost like it didn't happen, or if it I mean it did happen, but it didn't matter because it just I kind of slid through that marriage and it nothing really touched me about it in many ways. Um I mean, I was struggling at that time with a sex addiction. This man I married, he was had his own issues. I won't get into his issues, but um, it's like we were married, but we were never together. And I think that that's why that, that memory just is gone. I mean, it's just never stuck with me. And there's nothing sort of tangible that, that would hold me to it. Um, I would love to talk about a quote on page 41 of the book. Um, I can flip there real quick. Yes. Um, that's at the bottom of the page. And it's a quote about waiting, which I think um, really piqued my interest. And it says, I'm faced with the trite but nonetheless frightening thought that life itself is a waiting room, waiting for breakfast, for school to start, for marriage or divorce waiting for an airplane to depart, for a concert to begin, for a parent to die, for a phone call with bad news, for an email with good news. Um, and it goes on a little bit, but I think that kind of gets the point. Um, and I was really, really thinking about that um, and how that sort of applied to, to the rest of your book of when you're trying to um, keep living. Um, <laughs> but you're saying that it's also just this sort of waiting. And I was wondering um, if there was a way in which the act of writing and the act of creating sort of pushes against that waiting. Yeah, I mean, I think that uh, the act of writing is a way of, um, oh, kind of remembering. And um, it's a way of living and writing is, um, it's a way to kind of um, claim the past. And so that um, as we're writing is the one time maybe when I'm not waiting for something to happen, 
because I actually am living, because if I'm writing something, I'm living in that moment. And the times when I'm not writing, I'm usually waiting either to write or to do something, um, you know, waiting to go, you know, go and do something, waiting, you know, for anything. But the, but the one time when I'm not waiting for something to happen is when I'm writing, because then I'm living in that moment. Um, and I'm also almost living it twice, which is sort of even more interesting because I'm living the moment from the past, but I'm also reliving it again now in the present as I recreate it. Um, you know, in creative nonfiction, we sort of have these two voices that we use, a voice that tells the story of what happened in the past, and then the, that reflective voice that um, does, in fact, reflect back on the past and sort of um, tells us what the meaning of the past, of that event in the past was, um, you know, what are the metaphors of that experience. So in some ways, that writing is, is living an event twice. And that is so um, fulsome that that is the time when my when I'm really full of life, and I don't have to be waiting for something to happen. And it's a does that answer your question? Kind of. No, I think it does, and I think as a follow up to that, in in the book, there's sort of the split between uh, writing about times that were almost very joyful and then there's also oh. writing about writing about a lot of trauma um and i'm just wondering how that applies there when you're thinking about writing as sort of that intentional revisiting and reliving um right does that how does that how does that impact you you know emotionally what what does that mean to intentionally relive something that is right that yeah a lot of um uh i think uh writers worry about or struggle with writing uh, traumatic incidents, things that uh, mm -hmm. might um, cause them to feel too much pain or um, discomfort. And I totally understand that. For me, that's not quite the case. It's true that when I'm writing about something traumatic, yes, I'm in touch with it. And so I feel it on some level, but, um, but it doesn't prevent me from writing it. Because it all, because I actually feel more of a sense of power, in that, okay, I survived the event in the past. Okay, so like my father sexually molested me growing up, so I've written about that. And when I write about it, what it does is, in fact, give me a sense of power and control. Because like now, he's gone, he's out of it. I can control the situation. I choose the words that I want to convey what happened. And it gives me a feeling of sort of empowerment over what had happened in the past that in some ways I could say like, I got the last word, you know? Um, and mm -hmm. so I really feel, so even though I can connect with the sadness and maybe the alienation and the loneliness and fear around something like say sexual assault, um, I can feel that, but, it's not, but that's, but I, that's only one of the feelings. The other feeling is this sense of um, power that I can get by claiming it. Like these are my words. I get to say how this felt, um, and by setting those words on paper, then I'm breaking silences. I'm giving that experience a voice, and so, so the sadness is sort of counteracted with um, that kind of sense of, okay, I'm a strong woman now and I can do this. I think that's a really empowering way to look at that. Um, and a really, when we're talking about that, that reshaping of memories and how they change over time to, to claim something like that, I think is, is really an awesome thing to think about. You know, it's that um, idea of sort of voice. You know, I think that in many ways, this a large part of the um, that hashtag Me Too movement arose mm -hmm. out of women writing their stories and breaking silences and telling sort of the family secrets. And there's so much power in that. And that's, you know, the thing to sort of maybe focus on is that, um, 
you know, yes, you can still, you can feel sad and let yourself feel that sadness, but also know that, you know, you survived that, you got through that. And now as a, as a powerful uh, person in your own right, that you can convey that narrative in your own language, in your own way, and with your own words. And I think that, that to me sort of relates to the, the theme of your book really well of if you're talking about surviving death, leaving that kind of narrative behind, you know, if you're talking about surviving death in the more metaphorical sense, um, which certainly is the, the, you know, possible one right now. <laughs> um, right now. I know right, that, you right, know, right. we're working on the other one for you, but yeah. <laughs> when you're talking about that in the metaphorical sense, I think having that kind of narrative in the world culturally um, is really important. And, you know, you do touch on at the end of the book, the, the cultural moment of me too um and i think that that's you know it, it to talk about that privately and publicly i think is really really interesting yeah yeah i know i mean like in this sort of a, what actually does remain i mean our art our culture our books our writing I mean, that's what survives through civilizations. We're still reading, you know, things from Greek right. mythology, right? I mean, that's what survives um, if sadly the human body does not. Right. You know, what do we what do we leave in the world? What do we leave behind? And um, art and culture are so important that, and all of our voices are important. You know, all of our narratives um, are part of the human narrative. And so it's so important for us to um, be able to tell our stories and to get our voices um, out there. And because that is what ultimately does survive. I love it. There's a, um, a quote by the writer Donna Tart um, in her book, The Gold Bench, which is about a painting which has survived a fire and an explosion and hundreds of years. And she says, um, it is a privilege to love that which death cannot touch. Um, and I think that that's, you know, it applies to art and it applies to, as you were saying, the writings that we leave behind um, and having the ability to, you know, read a narrative that you can connect with in some way. And then that stays with you. There's no, there's no way for that to go away. Exactly. I mean, you know, think of all the books you've read or all the artworks that you've seen you know museums you've gone to um you know there's the cliche we are what we eat but i think that we are what we read or what we witness i mean to me is much more relevant so when i think of um oh you know books i was reading in you know elementary school on up i mean on some level sure you love some books more than others but that said i mean all those words are sort of become part of you and so those authors, I mean, that's an incredible, I mean, they do still exist in that way. Right. I mean, it sort of gives me shivers in some ways. Like, <laughs> like I just thought of some of my favorite authors, like, you know, Jean Reese, who wrote Wide Sargasso mm -hmm. Sea. And like, I absolutely love that novel, sort of an autobiographical novel. And the thought that she's sort of living on in me is very cool, but yeah. it sort of gives me shivers. <laughs> It's a, it's a really powerful thing to think about. And I mean, even, you know, reading reading your book, um, you know, before talking to you about it, there's something that, that stays with you about that narrative of, of places that, you know, as a woman, you can connect to it as, you know, any person who is rationally afraid of death. I think, especially in, in our current moment, there's um, an escalated fear of, of dying that has come to the front lines in a way that, a lot of people haven't had to think about um, regularly and, and getting to take that in and absorb that and see um, how someone else has already processed through this is really, really fascinating. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, this, you know, this odd time we're on in scary time, this pandemic, um, it's, it should, I mean, nobody wants this to have happened, obviously. It's really scary. I mean, really scary. But if it is a time to kind of reflect on your life and what do you want your heritage to be, how do you want to be remembered? 
and it's maybe a time to um, uh, think about things like that. I mean, if you have you been putting off writing a book or a poem or something, um, you know, maybe that's the time to do it. Um, <laughs> Not that, you know, we're all going to stay in our homes and stay safe, so we're going to be okay. Yeah. But it's just, but it is something just to think about, um, like, I don't have children. And um, so my DNA, you know, that's it. You know, I might I got two cats, but they're not, they don't have me to not inherit my DNA. So, um, you know, but yet, and that's okay. I mean, I, I didn't want children, so, mm -hmm. but we all have something that we want to be remembered for. And what are the good works that we can do? I mean, right now in this pandemic, there are people doing extraordinary, I mean, you think of the doctors and nurses doing extraordinary things. And that is a real legacy. You know, for those of us who can't do, don't know how to do that, I mean, we have other things that we do. And um, culture, writing, our words, books, are, as I say, really important because that is how, you know, civilizations really survive and know, you know, sort of what came before. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I love to think about that, about, you know, when you're thinking about what can you do right now and what can you leave. Um, writing is certainly a part of that. Um, it really is. You know, I've seen some posts on, like on Facebook and seven people th saying that, oh, well, right now, why would I be writing about something that's not part of the pandemic? Because, you know, my story is like so irrelevant right now. And I always say, no, 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 that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you do have a pandemic story to write, which, you know, I mean, I hope you sort of don't because that might, right. but, but whatever your story is, whatever your narrative is, is important. It's part of our, you know, of our being, our culture. And so, Maybe yes, right now, today, maybe you don't feel like writing about it, but but just to know that it is ultimately very important, whatever your story is. I mean, all voices are important. All voices deserve to be heard. You know, my story isn't any more important than anybody else's. They're just, they're all important because nobody can tell my story. Nobody can tell your story. I mean, we have to own our own truths. And if we don't write them, and if we don't tell them, right. then they're gone for all time. And to me, that's like the saddest thing. The thought that, you know, if you didn't write your story or in some way make your sort of mark on the world, nobody else can do it for you. That, that really is a sad thing. And I think that, you know, earlier I said that in some ways my book is really about how to survive life. And in some ways I think that that's true because how we all do have challenges and how do we get through them? How do we make sense of our lives? How do we overcome things? One way I do it is through writing. Um, also years of therapy, but that aside, um, in a deeper way, one way to get through it is through writing. I mean, that's how I make sense of my life is how I sort of give it a, an organization and can understand it. Changing gears a little bit um, before that we're done, before we're done today, I would love to talk a little bit about craft um, because I know that we have a lot of writers sure. in this group. Um, and there's always the conversation about, you know, writing the memoir in essay form versus the straight narrative. Um, and I know that you've done both. And I know that this is um, a book of essays, which my personal opinion, very effective. Um, so, you know, just, Maybe we can talk about that a little bit and sort of the, the choice there of what kind of story we, we weave through essays like this. Sure. Um, I think that <clears throat> the, the one nice thing that I like about writing a, um, <clears throat> a memoir in essay form is kind of the flexibility it gives you because it's, um, there is a common theme, a thematic thread that mm -hmm. runs throughout it that you know, you want sort of each essay to kind of cohere to. But within that, you have so much range. Um, so like I look at death through the lens of a lot of different ways. I mean, as I say, I look, I do um, write about my fear of physical death. So there's that. And then on top of that, there's my hypochondriacs, my hypochondria. So I'm always thinking, oh my God, I've got some 
you know, terrible disease right now and I'm about to die. So I can write about that, but then also about these uh, more emotional and spiritual forms of death that, um, you know, things like, so I do write um, some about the sex addiction that I struggled with. And I write about, you know, these two divorces. I mean, I maybe don't remember the marriage, but I do remember the divorces. <laughs> and so writing about that, but like in this book, so I had this one essay, which is uh, focuses on the my my obsession with the singer Adam Lambert, how he reminds me one of my of, favorites. Thank you. You know, he, he reminds me of sort of my young hippie days when sort of I felt very alive and like, you know, and I can survive anything. So I've got an essay about uh, Adam Lambert, but yet also in this collection, I have an essay about the cannibal Jeffrey Dahmer. I mean, very dissimilar, needless to say, you know, Adam Lambert, Jeffrey Dahmer. They, on the face of it, they have nothing in common. Yet, um, in the book, I can uh, craft these essays so that they don't, they themselves don't have anything in common, but the way that they juxtapose with my life and my fear of death, they do. Um, in that, um, so Jeffrey Dahmer, the reason why I was sort of obsessed with him is that um, he was uh, caught at about the time when I was entering rehab for sex addiction and an eating disorder. So he's a cannibal, clearly has like, you know, the eating disorder of all eating disorders. And so, and he, that he is a metaphor for death in many ways. And as an addict, I was really struggling with, um, not that the sex addiction was necessarily gonna kill me, but the eating disorder could, but yet emotionally and spiritually, I was dying from this addiction. So it's not so much that I actually wrote about either Adam Lambert or Jeffrey Dahmer, although on the surface, I write about them, but the importance of them in the book is how they're, uh, how are they a metaphor for me? Where does that metaphor sort of juxtapose with my own life? So in this essay collection or any essay collection, you can really branch out like that when you're not having to follow, you know, one straight through narrative. You know, my first two books, um, because I remember Terror Father, I Remember You and Lovesick, are like these straight through narratives. And then the Papoon Fan Club and then this book um, are essay collections. And so, as I say, it gives you just much more flexibility to explore a theme through the lens of lots of different um moments in your life, different images, different details, and yet it can still hold together. Does that make sense? Yeah, there's something that I really love there about reaching across culture and pop culture and the public perception of pop culture um, and using that as sort of like a, a recognizable point and then turning it into that private moment. Um, yeah, that's a really good way of saying it, turning it in, because that's key, because it is turning that public um, moment into something that's private. There's um, this one section where I use the song Islands in the Stream, that duet by mm -hmm. Kenny Rogers and Dolly Parton. And um, so the the essay is about a time when I'm having a real um, I'm having an affair with a married man. I'm committing adultery and doing all of these really scary things to myself. And I happened to hear that song at that time. And so, again, it's not so much about the song, but how it intersects with me to a time that was really, um, uh, again, I felt as if I was emotionally dying. And I felt in some ways, maybe like sort of metaphorically, like, I mean, I know it's sort of a country western love song, but the way I interpret it in the essay is that I'm just like this lonely little island all by myself in this stream rushing past. And so it's how we take these cultural references that are out in the public, but make them very private. Mm -hmm. No, and I think that's very true. I think in, in the same way that we were talking earlier about that shifting of memory, we sort of shift that, that perception of something that we see or something that we hear 
and we mold it into, you know, our, our, ourselves and into our lives. Um, and it sort of folds into um, our own experience. I certainly um, feel that way about, about different points in pop culture. Um, exactly. Yeah. It's sort of like, I see them kind of like as portals to, it's like a portal into um, personal experience. Mm-hmm. And, but yet it's a nice way to sort of have kind of the outside world and the interior world, the external and the internal kind of um, mesh. And um, uh, it sort of opens up your story a little bit, I think, too, by having these sort of pop culture references. Plus, I just kind of love pop culture in many ways. (laughs) So, (laughs) but it's it's important to know why. I mean, like, why do certain things attract me and others just, you know, nothing? Yeah. Is there anything else that you want to talk about after what we've been saying? Well, I think that um, what's important is that um, writing creative nonfiction, uh, a lot of, I think, maybe beginning writers worry about um, upsetting people, like, oh, what will my mother think? What will the next door neighbor think? How will people judge me? Mm-hmm. And um, And I really understand that concern. I mean, it's scary to put yourself out there. But I guess my plug is that I think it's okay to be scared about that, but write anyway, in that <clears throat> it's important to take risks. It's important to take you know emotional risks and value your story and know that maybe you're going to sort of shake up the status quo, but isn't that the role of the artist? You know, the role of the artist is to shake up the sort of the status quo, take risks. And our job as writers is not to make people feel comfortable. No, it is not to make people feel comfortable. If we're making people feel really comfortable, we're probably not doing our job as writers. It means that you want to go even deeper and really sort of rattle things around and get people upset in a way. You know, um, I mean, that's how change comes about. Um, again, to go back to the hashtag Me Too movement, you know, it's like really um, speaking loudly and making your voice heard. So I just want to encourage um, other writers to know that if you do upset your mother or your uncle or your aunt or your sister, let them be upset. I mean, that's kind of okay if it gets them thinking. And if we keep telling our secrets or if we're scared of um, of what people might think, then in some ways those relationships are not authentic anyway. If you're kind of living, still living kind of the secrets from childhood and you're afraid to sort of, you know, rock the boat, then those relationships are not that authentic anyway. So really it is okay and more than okay to go out there, take risks, upset the status quo, change things. And really we're all in it together and all of our voices together, we support each other. So if you're doing that, you're not alone. We're all, we all can sort of help each other, you know, uh, find that way to put our, our stories, our narratives out into the world. So thank you. I think that's certainly great for me to internalize as a young writer. And I'm sure a lot of people can relate to that. Yeah. Um, and I, you know, I know it's hard. I mean, it is like, oh God, somebody's going to hate me if I write this. Um, that's difficult. But yet think of the alternative. If you never write your story and don't put it out there. And if you live in that fear, then at some point you're going to feel regret as well you know, that, oh, I really had that opportunity. And so I say, just, you know, go for it. But really do know that, you know, there is this big community of writers and we are supporting each other. So if you're struggling, you know, find somebody else. And by the way, I'm easy to find. Um, My 
uh, if you want to contact me, my website is suewilliamsilverman.com. My contact information is there and I'm all over social media. So, but you know, it's not just me. I mean, we're all in this together and we all will and can support each other. You know, so if you're scared, you can be scared, but sort of right anyway, and know that somebody is standing next to you, supporting you. Those are really great words to hear, especially right now. So thank, thank you for you. sharing them. Thank you. And thanks so much to AWP for having me. I mean, I absolutely love AWP. I mean, it's just, it's such a great organization for writers. I mean, I feel very heard and represented by AWP. And, you know, my first book won the AWP award back in like, oh, 97 or something. And I've just have loved AWP ever since. It's, um, it really is a place for our voices to be heard and to be supported. Um, you know, it's just such a safe organization for that to, you know, the way it embraces writers um, of all kinds and all voices. So many, much gratitude and many thanks to, to you and to AWP. Thank you. Well, we so appreciate hearing that and we so appreciate you and um, all that you do for AWP and um, all that you're doing for this book club. So Thank you. it's been a really great conversation. I'm glad we got to have it. Me too. Thanks for asking such great questions. <laughs>